Okay, could I ask members and indeed those in the public gallery who are leaving the chamber to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 6671 in the name of Maggie Chapman on the Fire Brigades Union decon campaign. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Uh, I would invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Uh, again, I would reiterate my plea to those leaving the public gallery to do so as quietly as possible and invite Maggie Chapman to open the debate for around seven minutes. Ms Chapman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It is a great privilege and honour to lead this debate, one of vital importance to every region and constituency in Scotland. And I thank all of those members who have supported my motion. I welcome and thank our guests in the public gallery this afternoon, Professor Anna Steck, from the University of Central Lancashire, and John McKenzie and his colleagues from the FBU. Welcome. For many of us here today, there is no more terrifying threat than fire, no greater heroes than firefighters. Each of us can perhaps take a moment to rediscover our memories, stories, and histories, all the ways that we and our families and communities owe so very much to those who keep us safe from the horrors of uncontrolled flames, of entrapment, suffocation and smoke. And in a world of climate change, apologies, presiding officer. And in a world of climate change, of drought and wildfire, of corporate corner cutting and official indifference, we need firefighters more than ever before. The burning tower of Grenfell stands as a terrible testament to the priorities of the powerful. We remember with grief those who lost their lives there and renew our solidarity with the hundreds injured and bereaved. And we know now of another appalling price that was paid for that greed and contempt, with the news that many firefighters who battled that blaze have now been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Grenfell represents a particular horror, but those impacts upon the health of firefighters are neither unique nor unusual. Here in Scotland, Anne's story is typical of the experience of firefighters and their families. Herself a nurse, she writes, and I quote, My husband George was due to retire from the fire service in June 2017, and we had planned our retirement, intending to travel and enjoy a new freedom. In July 2017, we were to be enjoying an extended holiday on a sunny beach. Instead, we were sitting in the waiting area of our local cancer hospital after he was diagnosed with stage 4 kidney cancer, six weeks before he retired. George sadly died in 2020 from cancer, and as many firefighters will tell you, they all know a colleague with a cancer diagnosis or one who has sadly died of cancer and often at a young age with a young family. I end that quote. A groundbreaking study led by Professor Anna Steck has been published in the scientific journal Occupational Medicine this month. It is entitled Scottish Firefighters Occupational Cancer and Disease Mortality Rates 2020 to 2020. Sorry, 2020. <coughs> and it reveals the extent the depth and the scope of the scandal. And we can with accuracy call it a scandal, I think, for it has gone unaddressed in the UK by research, law and practice. The study indicates that Scottish firefighters have a higher mortality rate from cancer at younger ages than their counterparts in the general population. Rare cancers are often only diagnosed in firefighters when they have already reached a terminal stage. And prostate cancer, leukemia, and cancer of the esophagus, among others, have mortality rates in firefighters which are several times that of the gener general population. Other diseases, too, are far more likely to kill firefighters than the rest of us, with mortality rates from stroke more than doubled and from heart attacks multiplied by five. These findings are supported by a four-part study of firefighters' health risks across the UK and by an assessment by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, part of the World Health Organization, which concluded that firefighting as an occupation was carcinogenic. Both these studies were published last year and align with evidence from many other countries. Yes. 
Martin Whitfield. I'm very, I'm very grateful to Maggie Chapman to give way on this point, and I congratulate her on securing this debate. Following the um, decision by the World Health Organization with regard to the carcinogenic attitude with regard to firefighters, does she agree with me that perhaps we now need to look to this being registered both as an industrial accident and disease so that support be can be given to firefighters across the UK? Maggie Chapman. I thank Martin Whitfield for that intervention and I will come on to some of the requests of the FBU's campaign but, but I think that is, would be a very interesting avenue to explore and I, I'd happily talk to him further about that af after this debate. Firefighters in the UK have waited far too long for the protections which are standard practice elsewhere. Many, as we know, have died waiting. We in Scotland now have the opportunity to change this, to bring justice, care, humanity and respect to the firefighters to whom we owe so very much. That is why I'm, I am calling upon the Scottish Government to make four vital commitments today. The first, very simply, is for regular annual health screening for firefighters, both during their period of service and afterwards into retirement. We know the importance of preventative health and the crucial difference made by early diagnosis. Let's give our fight firefighters and the medics who care for them the best possible chance of avoiding the worst. The second commitment which I and the FBU are seeking is that occupational information be included in health and similar records, including on death certificates. Again and again, in this chamber and in our committee rooms, we reiterate the vital importance of data, of accurate information to inform policy and practice. Where patients are or have been firefighters, that fact matters. It needs to be known and recorded. The third reform that firefighters need is for a just and fair compensation scheme, and this maybe relates to the point that Martin Whitfield was making. Many jurisdictions, including Australia, Canada, Poland, and nearly all US states, have presumptive legislation for firefighters, laws that recognize their enhanced risk and the realities of long-term and repeated exposure. We can learn from best practice across the world to develop a Scottish model, filling that shameful gap in our justice and protection. And finally, I'm asking for a budget to support the practical work that needs to be done on the ground in fire stations across Scotland. We need to ensure, as a matter of urgency, that stations have the resources, the facilities, the training and the systems to minimise contam contamination and to maximise health. It is a substantial task, but an achievable one. And the FBU is ready and willing to work with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, with the Scottish Government and with us as MSPs to make it happen in every constituency. Three years ago in Dundee, a huge fire broke out at an industrial estate in a unit, the roof of which contained asbestos cement. It is too early to know whether those burning fibres in the air have affected the health of the brave local firefighters who put out the blaze. What we do know is that firefighters across Scotland, day in and day out, bear the risks of significant and life-threatening disease. Far too long, those risks to firefighters in the UK have been higher, much higher than they need to be. Our firefighters put their lives on the line every day for us, for the safety of our homes and the well-being of our pets and our communities. They are the ones we trust to come into our homes. They are the public servants that command the highest levels of public support and respect. It is time for us in Scotland to take a lead, to recognise and respect our heroes, to support and enable the Fire Brigades Union's vital campaign. I hope the Minister will agree to meet with the FBU and me to discuss how best we can do that, because it is definitely time to act. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Chapman. Understandably, there's a lot of interest among colleagues to participate in the debate. We started late and uh, afternoon business uh, will resume at 2 p.m. So I'm going to have to ask colleagues to stick to the speaking uh, time uh, allocations. And with that, uh, I ask uh, Joe Fitzpatrick to be followed by Russell Finlay. Up to four minutes, Mr Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you also to Maggie Chapman for securing this important debate. I want to begin by... Um, joining colleagues to come, I'm sure, across the chamber by placing my gratitude on the record to all fire and rescue officers and indeed to all emergency service workers who keep us all safe on a daily basis. 
Presiding officer, that collective gratitude is, however, worthless if we do not heed the warnings of Professor Anastek, whose groundbreaking research has informed the Fire Brigade Union's decon campaign. As we have heard from Maggie Chapman, UK firefighters are four times more likely to get cancer in their working life. And I, I thought it was important to repeat that shocking statistic. In short, the decon campaign aims to protect firefighters and their families from carcinogenic fire contaminants. Not only um, are our firefighters risking their lives to keep us all safe, they are risking their health and the health of their family. I am pleased, therefore, that Parliament is debating this matter. It is incumbent on all of us to do everything within our power to protect those who risk their lives to protect us. President officer, I had the pleasure of visiting Blackness Fire Station in my constituency recently and having discussed the, the decon campaign directly with firefighters, I submitted a written question um, to the Minister on the matter and I was very pleased to be informed by the Minister that Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is engaging with this research and met Professor Steck in November last year to hear directly about the important research she is doing and to offer Scottish Fire and Rescue Services uh, cooperation on that work. I was further informed that Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have a manage, management of contaminants group which has already made significant changes in procedures, equipment and facilities to reduce firefighters' contact with equipment which could contain contaminants harmful to health. I understand that that important work will continue and it is really important that this Parliament uses its power to make sure it does. Signing officer. I understand that one of the difficulties encountered by officers is having suitable facilities to decontaminate their protective equipment after use, um, often reusing um, the same equipment for a, a second emergency um, call-out. One of the, the key recommendations in Professor Stack's reports is for all fire and rescue services to establish and strictly maintain designated zones within the fire station as a priority for preventing cross-contamination. And that won't be, always be straightforward. So I call on the Scottish Fire and Rescue to work with the FBU at a station level to establish designated zones as quickly as possible. Setting officer, the report sets out some of the ways in which fire fighters may be exposed to toxic contaminants, including inhalation, dermal absorption and ingestion. The report also highlights some of the health risks um, caused by exposure. Um, in addition to cancer, such as coronary heart disease, cirrhosis um, of the liver and many others. Um, I have a quote, but I am mindful of the presiding officer's um, points regarding timing. Um, so um, I would encourage people to look at the report from uh, the decon um, work. Um, but, presiding officer, I want to conclude by thanking Maggie Chapman once again for securing this important debate um, on this matter, which has allowed members across the chamber to highlight the risks experienced by fire firefighters every day. I would also like to thank the Fire Brigade Union and Professor Anna Stack, Steck um, and her team um, in the University of Central um, Lancashire. And finally, I want to thank all our fire and rescue officers once more for keeping us all safe. I hope that the Scottish Government can work with Scottish Fire and Rescue and the FBU to ensure that all of the key recommendations of the report are implemented and implemented as soon as possible. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Fitzpatrick, not least for your exemplary timekeeping, setting a good example. Russell Finlay to be followed by uh, Polly McNeill. Up to four minutes, Mr Finlay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I begin by informing the Chairman that I have a commitment to attend an event at Glasgow Airport this afternoon, which means I am unable to stay for the duration of Maggie Chapman's important debate. I mean her no disrespect, and I am grateful to you, Deputy President Officer, for agreeing to my request to leave after today's opening speeches. The issues raised today are extremely serious. The University of Centre, Central Lancashire study commissioned by the FBU and referred to in Maggie Chapman's motion is shocking. Professor Stack and her team found deeply concerning cancer rates amongst firefighters. This follows last year's WHO designation of firefighting as a carcinogenic occupation. I know that others will talk in detail about these findings. I turn to the two most significant recent publications from or about the SFRS. The first is the Scottish Government's Fire and Rescue Framework for Scotland, which was published 10 months ago. It contains seven strategic priorities, number six of which is the category of people. There are references to fair work and pay, equal opportunities, new skills and being representative of society, 
all important stuff, no doubt. Yet in 37 pages, there are just two paragraphs about health, well-being and safety, and not a single mention of contaminants. The other report is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service Annual Performance Review, which was published four months ago. It lists 10 priorities, number 10 of which is people. This comprises almost five pages talking about diversity, inclusion and other matters. There is a page about physical well-being, mostly in the context of physical fitness. Again, this is all very important, but the entire 48-page report contains just two sentences on contaminants, and I quote, we continue to strengthen our approach to health and medical surveillance and considering a range of options to ensure we deliver health assessments in accordance with our statutory requirements. This really doesn't tell us much, and I don't know what the firefighters here and elsewhere would make of it. Two official reports, 85 glossy and expensive pages, yet only the most fleeting mention of contaminants, contaminants that are likely to be the cause of high cancer rates and premature deaths. I don't doubt for a moment the commitment of senior officers towards their people. Few organisations have such an admirable esprit de corps. I saw this firsthand on a recent visit to Paisley Fire Station. But I'm left questioning why this corporate output shies away from this important issue. The bottom line, Deputy Presiding Officer, is money. Specifically, it's about financial choices made by government. More specifically, it's about choices made by SNP ministers in Edinburgh about how money is spent. Many fire stations are old, lack basic facilities, and they're in a state of serious disrepair. It's beyond question that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has been starved of cash year after year after year. And you don't have to take my word for it. Interim Chief Officer Ross Haggart has confirmed to Parliament's Criminal Justice Committee that he needs £500 million just to bring infrastructure up to a decent standard. That's half a billion pounds. Deputy Presiding Officer, in closing, I commend Maggie Chapman's motion and I also back her specific calls for action on this very important subject. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Finlay. I now call Polly McNeill to be followed by Bill Kidd. Up to four minutes, Ms McNeill. I thank Maggie Chapman sincerely and also for a superb speech um, this afternoon. I was delighted to host the presentation of this report with her earlier or late last year. According to Action on Asbestos, a firefighter is two and a half times more likely to develop mesothelioma, a type of lung cancer. And mesothelioma is invariably a fatal cancer that results from exposure to asbestos fibres. It causes horrific suffering and loss, not only to those affected, but also their family and friends who have witnessed someone close to them suffer and die. Asbestosis-related illnesses are not the only risk that firefighters face, as you have heard, as a result of their occupation. Firefighters are four times more likely to get cancer, sometimes up to 15 years earlier than the average working person. This has been directly linked to toxic contaminants released during fires, and it is unacceptable that this actual fact of the matter continues to go unaddressed any longer. As you have heard from other speakers, the World Health Organization declared occupational exposure experienced by firefighters as a carcinogenic, preventable cause of human cancer. But yet, there is no mandate or policy for regular checks or screening for cancer throughout their careers. Totally unacceptable. But it's not an issue confined to Scotland. We've heard recently that a dozen firefighters who tackled the blaze at the Grenfell Tower in June 2017 have since been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So there's no doubt that firefighters are exposed to health and life-threatening contaminants as a result of their occupation. There have been a number of studies that focus on the risks and dangers associated with the contaminated personal protective equipment and workplaces. And a large focus was placed on the bringing of contaminants back to the stations on clothing, PPE and vehicles. And these studies have shown that there is a preventable high risk of exposure to carcinogenic and toxic substances in fire stations. 
But as we've heard in the presentation, firefighters working in rural parts of Scotland have expressed fear that they are at an increased risk of cancer because so many of our rural stations are without running water. And their inability to shower quickly after returning from fires means that they cannot properly clean cancer-causing chemicals released during fires on their clothes and skin. I'm sure the Minister will address this question because our report last year stated that 11 Scottish fire stations in remote countryside areas had inadequate facilities, a matter I know that the FBU have repeatedly raised. Professor Steck's study and research commissioned by the FBU now absolutely confirms what firefighters and their representatives in Scotland have been advocating for years. Unfortunately, firefighting causes cancer. Um, in my last minute, presiding officer, I just wanted to address the question of all of Maggie Chapman's ask, which I fully support. But worryingly, it seems that the Industrial Injuries Disablement and Benefit Advisory Group set up by the government in 2016 hasn't met for some time. And I think it's important that we get that up and running. Having previously been involved in the fight against asbestos and cancers and other industries, I think it's maybe important to look at the causal link which is clearly established and establish and look at whether or not there's now an accepted causal link, uh, which sadly is the case for workers who do need to challenge their employers and fight for compensation for being put in these conditions. We should make it easy for firefighters to be able to do this in the way we have done for other professions such as shipyard workers, for example, under the mesothelioma compensation scheme. Uh, difficult issue to raise, but it's one that we must address. I fully support the Fire Brigade Union's uh, uh, asks on this matter, and I look forward to hearing the Minister's response. Thank you very much, Ms McNeill. I now call Bill Kidd to be followed by Katie Clark. Up to four minutes, Mr Kidd. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you also to um, both Maggie Chapman um, for hosting this important debate today, and to Unity Consulting, led by Neil Finlay, for their contributory work in bringing this campaign to the attention of the Scottish Parliament. 15 million, that is the number of firefighters working globally to protect people and the environments with living and working by putting themselves on the line by entering some of the dangerous situations to take control of fires and save lives. This is an inherently dangerous job and these firefighters deserve our praise and respect for the risks they have to take. Today, however, we are here to do more than just that. We are here to look at what we can do to protect the health of firefighters in return. The Fire Brigade Union's decon campaign outlines practical steps that can be taken to promote the health of firefighters. This is based on new findings revealing higher cancer risks firefighters face just by doing their jobs. This campaign is based on the comprehensive work of Professor Anna Steck from the Centre uh, for Fire and Hazard Science at the University of Central Lancaster, uh, UCLan for short. The FBU has been working with UCLan for three years to understand the link between fire exposure and cancer. Together, they have now evidence that firefighters are four times more likely to get cancer than the average working person. And this drives home how important it is that parliamentarians, the government, unions, fire stations and firefighters themselves gain the best possible understanding of what health risks there are being exposed to and what preventative actions can be taken. The FBU General Secretary made a strong statement to this effect, saying that the report delivers clear and authoritative guidance to fire and rescue services across the UK about the measures they can take to minimise firefighters' exposure to contaminants. Right now, there is a step change happening in the firefighting profession to re-evaluate how health is best protected, and this is because of vital research done globally which has facilitated this shift. Last year, the World Health Organization looked for the second time at cancer rates amongst firefighters. They were able, finally, to verify that cancer is more likely due to the work of 30 global studies that had monitored firefighters' health. However, as UCLan has shown, this is not translated yet into awareness on the ground, as 84 per cent of firefighters um, frequently or sometimes uh, don't know about uh, using 
respiratory protective equipment well enough, despite inhalation and ingestion being one of the main routes for cancer to develop. More needs to be done to incorporate the report's suggestions so that these statistics are reversed. Facilities must also be in place on site for cleaning and decontamination. Finally, I would like to close by highlighting some parallel work in the welding sectors to address the issue of inhalation and ingestion of carcinogenic contaminants. John, Brown's, uh, John Brown at, at the GMB based BAE systems on the Clyde have launched the Breathe Easy campaign to address the impact of heavy metal welding fumes on members and their families. And I think there's a potential for collaboration across sectors with similar cancer risks on how we can encourage preventative measures to be adopted so that there is more uptake in workers following protective procedures and that there is significant and sufficient provision for these measures from employers and government in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Kent. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Jamie Green. Up to four minutes, Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I congratulate Maggie Chapman on securing this debate and thank the Fire Brigade Union for all the work that they're doing on this issue. The exposure of firefighters to toxins during the course of their employment is creating a health crisis. There are currently 357 fire stations in Scotland and the FBU estimate that over 100 lack sufficient showering or toilet facilities. This figure was confirmed by Interim Chief Officer Ross Haggart when I questioned him at the Criminal Justice Committee recently. He also confirmed that around one in four fire stations in this country lack basic bathroom facilities and some stations do not have a running water supply. In total, 220 are in poor or bad condition. 150 do not have showering facilities, 100 <coughs> lack drying facilities and 11 have no water supply at all. The FBU also claim a number of stations are held together by internal scaffolding. The Fire and Rescue Service have also cancelled a multi-million pound contract for a new command and control system due to financial pressures. And Mr Haggart estimated that £138 million was needed just to address these essential health and safety issues which are being highlighted. He also said there was, um, he also said there was a further £630 million backlog on the fire services capital budget. So these issues are nothing to do with budgetary issues this year. These issues are nothing to do with whatever settlement may be coming for Westminster. These issues are a result of a failure to give the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service the resources it needs to invest in its capital projects over many, many years. And I believe it's shameful that we're in this position today. The resource budget for the fire service has been cut by £40 million in real terms since 2012-13 and is set to su suffer a further real -time terms cut over the next four years. It is clear that there is a very rich seam of research which shows that firefighters as an occupation is carcinogenic. I think it's also clear legally that the employers have a responsibility and if cases were taken to court that they would be liable. There are very practical issues that this debate raises. We know that over the period 2020, um, 12 to 2013 until last year, almost 1,100 firefighter jobs were cut across the uniform post in Scotland, which is almost 15% of the total workforce. This is partially due to a lack of investment, but there's also a growing perception that firefighting is not a safe profession and the pay levels are not attractive, and the FBU is currently balloting over pay. 
I think the message that comes out of the debate today is that the Scottish Government need to make a top priority to make sure that the risks which are being highlighted in this debate today are, rescue, are, are addressed. They have a legal responsibility to act, as the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have a responsibility to put into place a safe um, system of work for the people they employ. Frankly, this situation isn't good enough. Firefighters deserve better. Thank you, Ms Clark. I now call Jamie Green to be followed by Richard Leonard. Up to four minutes, uh, Mr Green. Thank you. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this uh, ahead of Richard Leonard. I know he's going to give a stomping speech uh, uh, on behalf of Scotland's firefighters, but I'll do my best, presiding officer. I want to thank Maggie Chapman for raising this issue in the Chamber today. It's a really important debate. It's an issue I've raised both in the Chamber and the Criminal Justice Committee on a number of occasions. We shouldn't be having this debate in members' business from opposition or backbenches. We should be having it from the government's benches because what's happened to Scotland's firefighters over the last 16 years is shameful and it's a mark of shame on the government. And I mean that as no disrespect to the minister on the front bench because I know she's new to the role and uh, new to the parliament, but this is a long time coming, this debate, and it's absolutely right that we get it on the record here today. The briefing from the FBU, I think, made it starkly clear and I, I, there's not much I can add to the statistics we've already heard in today's debate from some of the excellent speeches that I've heard already. But they've made some very clear asks, and those were reiterated by Ms Chapman at the beginning of the debate today. The introduction of legislation so that firefighters have a clear route to compensation. Now, I know I've worked in legislation around compensation in this parliament before. I know it's difficult, I know it's complicated, but it's not impossible. And that's something I want the government to reflect on. Annual health mo monitoring for all firefighters and those who have retired. And that's key, because let's think the average age of a firefighter in Scotland is 41 years of age. They fall well below the threshold of many of the standard checks that older people would currently get. But we know they need those checks for all the reasons we've already heard today. And the last and most important one I want to focus on in my brief comments is investment in facilities, equipment, and what I call the basics. These are the absolute basics. I raised it in this chamber before. None of us would come in and sit in this parliament if the roof was dripping and falling down. None of us would sit in our offices if we couldn't go to the toilet. None of us would cycle into work if there wasn't a shower facility at the end of every corridor in the members' block. Why would we put up with such conditions, but we expect firefighters to do the same? And it's shocking and it's shameful. They are putting their life on the line, day in, day out, every hour of every day. In recent events, very high profile, fires across Scotland have reminded us of the absolute tragedy that can occur uh, uh, when fires break out. But they're always there for us when we need them. Why are we not always there for them? I want to uh, mention also briefly when the firefighters uh, on, with the FBU held a protest outside this parliament in October last year, I went out to see them. I did get some bemused looks from some of the trade union officials, but nonetheless, I was pleased to be there, and I think they were grateful for my presence. And the reason I went out, Minister, is because I went out to speak to the firefighters themselves. It's all very well hypothecating over academic studies. Let's go and talk to them one to one. And they told me what it's like on the ground. They're really proud of the work they do. They're really proud of the success rate they have, but they do it in the most difficult of circumstances. You know, why do we have fire stations with no running water? And basic shower facilities. It's that decontamination which needs to happen quickly within hours or even minutes of getting back to the fire station. If you can't have a shower, if you can't change your clothes, of course you're going to be at higher risk of cancerous uh, 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 outcomes later in life. We know that. The health experts tell us that. The academics tell us that. If we know all that, why can't a firefighter do the most basic thing when they get home and have a shower? We all do it, so why can't they and the government needs to think about that and as is mentioned by Katie Clark it is about budget and it's about capital budget not resource budget it's not a pay discussion it's about investment in facilities there's half a billion pounds backlog now I know the minister doesn't have half a billion pounds up her sleeve to fix that but this has been happening for 16 years this chronic underinvestment, and the minister must reflect on that the government must not just apologize but realize what it's going to do to make difference I'm not expecting to pull uh, rabbits uh, out of hats to, to find that kind of money. But it's going to come, have to come up with a plan on how they're going to invest in basic facilities so that we reduce the risks. I simply want to close on this. I could talk about this all day because it's a really important issue. But every one of us in this chamber owes it to Scotland's firefighters to protect them as much as possible. It is simply not happening. We are playing catch up with our emergency services. This government must and should do better. 
Thank you, Mr Green. I now call Richard Leonard to be followed by Carol Mochan. Up to four minutes, Mr Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Maggie Chapman for bringing this motion to Parliament? And can I thank the Fire Brigades Union for supporting this critical, significant, groundbreaking research carried out by Anna Steck and her team at the University of Central Lancashire? That there is a direct relationship between working class occupations and life expectancy health and well-being has long been recognised. I mean, go and look at the old trade union banners. Shorter hours and longer life. Out of darkness into light. The hope of labour is the welfare of all. A reminder that the trade union movement from its very inception has always organised and campaigned for its members and not just to mitigate the effects of the system but to fundamentally change the system. So what comes in this report should not surprise us, but it should nonetheless shock us all, and it should shame the government into action. The findings are stark. Scottish firefighters, compared with the general population, are almost twice as likely to die from urinary cancers. Two and a half times more likely to die from cancer of the esophagus. More than three times as likely to die from acute my Lord, my Lord leukemia, and nearly four times more likely to die from cancer of the prostate. So let us be clear, this high prevalence and high mortality rate of cancer is caused by occupational exposure, which is why it strikes not only the older, but the younger firefighter too. Only last week, the Daily Mirror revealed that just five years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, 12 of the heroic firefighters who saved so many lives there themselves are now suffering from rare terminal cancers. Some are aged only in their 40s. And yet as recently as March 2021, the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council ruled against recognising cancer as a prescribed disease for firefighters, citing, I quote, insufficient evidence. Well, now we have the irrefutable evidence. Now we have this new data. So not to right this wrong would not only be an abdication of duty, it would be a negation of the truth and it would be justice denied. So the action we need from the SNP Green Government is this. Resources for our fire and rescue service for preventative screening and monitoring of firefighters irrespective of age. Second, the routine monitoring of firefighters exposed to toxic fire effluents after attending incidents. Three, we need properly resourced and active joint health and safety committees, but we also need facility time for training on the FBU DECON programme as part of that preventative health approach. And fourthly, now we have the devolution of IIDB, Industrial Injuries Disablement Benefit, we should have our own active Industrial Injuries Advisory Council for Scotland. That is precisely what my old friend and comrade Alex Bennett, a miner, trade unionist, a tireless fighter for his class, not least at IIDB appeals tribunals, who sadly passed away last week long campaigned for. That is how we should honour his memory. And it's precisely as well what Mark Griffin is calling for in his Members' Bill. This FBU campaign is about saving the lives of those who save the lives of others. We keep our faith in them. It's now our turn to repay their faith in us. Justice for our firefighters, victory to the FBU. Thank you, Mr Leonard. And I now call Carol Mochen. Up to four minutes, Ms Mochen. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you to Maggie Chapman for bringing the debate to the Chamber, um, to everyone who has spoken as the last speaker, and of course, welcome to the guests in the gallery and thanks to them. Many of us will have friends, family members or colleagues who have been diagnosed with cancer and witnessed the intolerable toll that that takes on them and their families. But for those who dedicate their lives to protect us from the risk presented by fire to life and property, the likelihood of suffering, as we've heard, um, that fee is four times higher. Totally unacceptable. 
But despite that knowledge, firefighters still bravely face the flames and take on the job that few of us have experience of. Experience of. And I just can't imagine what it feels like and that bravery to continue to do the job that they love. As with so many things relating to cancer and other associated health outcomes, we still do not fully understand the precise detail, details of why that increased exposure is um, so prevalent in, in the line of work. But this absolutely brilliant report and the accompanying campaign, we now know so much more. And even better than that, we do know some of the information and detail that we must take, the steps that we must take to protect these workers. This is a truly groundbreaking piece of research um, and it lays the foundation for an, import, an improvement in the fire service, the likes of which we have not seen for, for many years. And it, it is important that we take, uh, take this report seriously. The FBU, FBU's decon campaign um, has been a welcoming example of how you can utilise first-class research and an increased awareness campaign to decrease harm and achieve progress in the workplace. And it is a model, I think, for the sort of work we should be doing right across uh, the workplaces in industry and services. And I wholeheartedly applaud, applaud the FBU and the team at the university uh, for, for this achievement and for taking this forward. This report not only provides evidence for the heightened risk for firefighters, uh, and what they face, but it provides practical steps that we can get behind that we've heard from other speakers. Um, and we can successfully minimise firefighters' exposure. Um, for the sake of time, I, I particularly want to uh, comment on the fact that I, some of the, the steps that can be taken are actually very simple. But as we have heard, because of the way in which we have seen the firefighters' workplace decrease and the resources go into that, it's quite shocking that we can't do some of those simple steps at this time. And I think everyone in the chamber would agree this must change immediately. This research is groundbreaking and we must meet these simple steps uh, immediately. So by taking simple steps such as wearing respiratory equipment at all times, preventing cross-contamination of PPE, changing clothes and showering within an hour, um, regular health screening for firefighters, and as one of the members mentioned, uh, retired fi firefighters, we can hugely change the outcomes, and it is absolutely essential that we do this. Can I conclude by again remarking on the importance of this study for firefighters and for the way in which we look at workplaces. It is so informative and I really enjoyed reading it and thinking about how this could change the outcomes for so many of our workers across industry and services um, and improve those, the outcomes for those valuable professions. So thank you for everyone who spoke and again to Maggie Chapman for bringing this crucial issue to the Chamber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Many thanks, Ms Mochan. I now invite Eleanor Whitham to respond to the debate. Minister, around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I too would like to thank Maggie Chapman for raising this important debate and bringing it to the attention of the wider Parliament today. I would also like to acknowledge the significant work of the Fire Brigades Union in commissioning this important research with the University of Central Lancashire and the production of the report that has been discussed today, which I have closely read. And I welcome them and Professor Anastek to the gallery um, today. The safety and health and well-being of all SFRS staff who work so hard to protect communities in some of the most challenging environments is of the utmost importance and a key priority to me. Now, whilst as the employer of firefighters in Scotland, the FBU decon campaign, the research and any of its subsequent findings are a matter for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, as Minister with Portfolio Responsibility, this is an issue that I intend to pursue rigorously, given its vital significance. Through regular meetings with the FRS board chair and chief officer, I am fully aware of this research. And I know that they have been engaged with this work for a number of years and met with Professor Anastek um, in November 2022 to hear directly about the important research she is doing and offer SFRS con continued cooperation on that work. SRS, 
um, established their Management and, Cont and Contaminants Working Group in 2018, which we've heard to look at a potential risks and how to support firefighting safety. The group does include representation from the FBU and has links to external specialists and is supported at the highest levels um, of SRS staff. The purpose of the working group is to look at technical, procedural and cultural solutions to mitigate the risks of personnel and any others who may be affected by the actions of SRS personnel being exposed to contaminants. Um, yep. Katie Clark. To the Minister, and I am very aware that she is quite new to the role, um, and um, this is a massive challenge that um, she has been presented with, but would she accept that in particular some of the research that is coming forward makes it clear that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have significant legal liabilities um, and that there will be a need for significant capital expenditure and then that puts this into a priority category for attention and is that something that, that she will try to address? Minister, I can give you the time back. Yeah, just to assure Katie Clark that I did say this is something that I intend to pursue rigorously um, for, for the reasons that she has outlined. You know, it's not that long ago that a soot-stained tunic was inextricably linked to the courage and the dedication of our firefighters, whilst now we absolutely know that this soot, along with the aerosol vapours, signify harmful contaminants. The SRS, SFRS have already made significant practical changes in procedures, equipment and facilities to reduce firefighter contact with equipment, equipment which could contain contaminants harmful to health. And this important work is going to continue. Presiding officer, many years ago, probably about 15 years ago, um, I was on call in a communal refuge in Ayrshire when we had a fire. And I will be forever indebted to the firefighters that came out that day um, and uh, their dedication to ensuring all the women and children were safe. One of the things I noticed for two years after that was the soot worked its way out of every single nook and cranny in that refuge. So that soot, I know, um, is, is a significant contaminant. So we know about some of the practical changes that has been introduced, including working practices to ensure that firefighting equipment is properly cleaned and stored to reduce contamination. Operational personnel who may have been exposed to contaminants are encouraged to shower as quickly as possible or on return to a station grounds. Now, I know um, that in some of our remote and rural areas, we have limited welfare facilities um, and procedures have been developed to ensure firefighters in these areas have appropriate decontamination solutions. And this is not um, ideal, and I intend to engage directly on this urgent matter. I am um, very clear on that. Um, and a number of steps have also been taken to mitigate risk. This includes supplying all SRS appliances and training centres with specialist decontamination wipes and the trial of station zoning systems to limit any potential spread. And that's something that another member mentioned um, earlier. Yep. Jamie Green. I am listening with interest, and I, I will take what the Minister is saying at complete face value and the urgency of the matter, but what I haven't heard are any of the practical solutions that I think we need to be hearing. It's all very well offering decontamination wipes to people, but they need showers, they need facilities. And if they don't exist, where are they going to come from? Minister. Yep. As um, Jamie Green himself pointed out, it's very difficult to answer those questions when I haven't actually directly engaged with the FBU on this matter, which I'm going to do um, in a few weeks um, as a, a, an extra meeting because of the significant importance of it. And I will come back um, on these issues because I do recognise um, the importance. Um, and opportunities are now being explored as to how the SFRS can work with Professor Steck on the potential positive impacts of policies, training and awareness and preventative measures as the contaminants group continues to explore steps to minimise risk and improve firefighter safety as a result of this newly published report. And as part of the wider commitment to the welfare of, of SRR staff, they have developed a dedicated cancer awareness and prevention area in their internal iHub. And I think that this is important given that some of the types of cancers we're talking about in, in, in some age groups is actually you know, more than just 1.5% or 5%. It's actually significantly higher than that. SFRS have also implemented enhanced cancer-focused screening questions and discussions during routine medical assessments, for example, skin checks, testicular and breast self-checks, and have introduced a data collection process to record, monitor and report on cancer diagnosis, which includes details of the type of cancer, age, gender, role, duty system, work and home location. Given the recent research highlighting a potential increase in the rate of heart attacks and strokes, I'm keen to, to explore this further and I'm engaged with both with the FBU on their asks surrounding annual health monitoring. I think that that's really important. 
Um, in February 2022, the service also signed the Dying for Work Charter to show continued commitment to the welfare of their staff by protecting rights um, at work of those facing a serious or terminal illness. It is important that they can choose the path that's right for them and their families without having the additional worry of financial uncertainty. And we will continue to carefully consider any specific proposals from the FBU on the potential for any new legislation surrounding compensation and protection. However, certain aspects of the health and safety um, legislation are reserved and specific proposals would be required so that they can be assessed against legislative, legislative competence. But I'm clear that I will work with the United Kingdom government on that should we get to that position. And my officials will also continue to investigate the current status and occupa of occupation recording and we will look at options and procedures to see if the proposed changes are feasible. Now, I know that capital resources are indeed very tight, specifically this year, and we have ensured that that will be protected at the level that it is. But I am um, going to continue to discuss capital requirements with SFRS, including looking at a degree of estate rationalisation to ensure that fire stations are located where they are most needed to cover risks in our communities and to allow additional investment to be made in remaining fire stations whilst keeping this research forefront in my mind. And, the yeah, Minister is just, just concluding, close, I'm afraid. <laughs> In closing, I again thank Maggie Chapman for the opportunity um, to discuss this issue and from members for their considered contributions from across the chamber. Presiding officer, for my retired firefighter uncle, forever known to his watchmates as Dark Cloud for his very sunny disposition, and for all current and future firefighters, rest assured, this is an issue that I am keenly focused on. And I look forward to working um, with the FBU um, and and on this matter at the meeting I'm going to have with them on the 1st of February. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting of Parliament, albeit very briefly, uh, until 2 p.m. <laughs>